Hey guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Oder, and today I'm doing probably the most special thing I have ever tried to cook. I've been looking for one of these things for literally years, but today I finally have it, a Japanese A5 Wagyu brisket. If you take a look at this brisket, it's supposed to be the same cut as what we get in the States, but you can see that it's cut a little bit differently. So they took out kind of big chunks of fat, and with this kind of Wagyu, the marbling is so insane that what is normally, you know, a well-marbled piece of brisket is almost pure fat. So the flat looks amazing. Like, I mean, there's more marbling in the flat than you could get on pretty much any kind of American steak. But I'm going to try and clean this up and get it ready to put on the cooker. And I'm going to do 275 burning pecan wood, and I'm seasoned with only salt and pepper. With a piece of meat this amazing, you don't want to ruin any part of it by adding a ton of stuff to it. So just salt and pepper and good quality clean smoke from a clean fire. All right, to give you a sense of how insane the marbling is in this flat, I just cut off the end where I'm just kind of rounding it off so nothing burns. That is ridiculous. I don't know how to emphasize enough how amazing this is. Also, because this is Wagyu, you see that just the sunlight is starting to melt the fat on this thing. We'll talk more about that later and why this is special, why Wagyu in particular is special, and even more specifically why Japanese A5 is the Rolls Royce of beef. But this just gives you a sense, and it's unreal. I, I have dreamed of cooking one of these for a long time, and this is living up even to greater expectations than I could have had. So the basic process for this brisket is gonna be essentially the same as for any other brisket that I do. I'm gonna trim off the fat on the top so it's not too thick, but with this Wagyu, you'll find out when I explain later why we don't have to be too concerned with that. But on the bottom side, on the underside of the meat, I wanna trim all that fat off so I get good smoke penetration because with smoke and penetrating and flavoring meat, it doesn't really work on the fat. You actually have to have exposed meat so the smoke can penetrate and you get a deep, clean, clear smoke flavor. So we're gonna trim this guy up like any other brisket. If you wanna see an in-depth review of that process, you can check out my How to Smoke a Brisket video, but I'm gonna get this guy ready and get it on the smoker. Okay, now we're trimmed up about as much as I want to do, and you have no idea how much it pains me to be trimming this stuff off because this was definitely not cheap. These trimmings I have on the cutting board, I would estimate that it's at least $100 worth of fat and stuff that I had to trim off, and that hurts a lot. But this is absolutely beautiful meat. This is the most gorgeous looking meat that I've ever seen on a brisket, and it's not even close. I mean, Okay, so if the best looking brisket I've ever seen is here in terms of marbling, this one is up here, like higher than I can reach. It's absolutely insane. So we're gonna season it up with some salt and pepper. I trimmed the top here to maybe a quarter of an inch of fat, pretty normal for me. And then I tried to trim as much fat off of the bottom as I could without actually digging into the meat. So I tried to avoid that. And I think the fat will render off on the bottom pretty well, so we'll still be able to get smoke flavor and smoke penetration in that underside to try and get great flavor, because I wouldn't want to do a disservice to this meat by not cooking it well. So at this point, all we're gonna do, is season it up, put it on the smoker. The brisket here, it's pretty long, but it's pretty thin in the flat, so I gotta watch it carefully. The last thing I would ever want to do is ruin this. Not only would it 
hurt me deep down inside. It would also hurt my wallet to waste such an incredible piece of meat. So here we go, salt and pepper, 50-50. As you can see, I didn't go too heavy with the rub because this is a pretty thin flat. And my thinking is if I over season this, I can't go back and I do not want to do that. So I'm gonna play it kind of safe, do a little bit of seasoning. And if necessary, we can add a little bit of finishing salt at the end. That's not gonna be a big deal. I think that this is an appropriate level of seasoning. I think it's just right. So put her on and wait to see the magic happen. All right, I'm nervous like a father to be here or something because I cannot wait for this thing to be done. Oh, it's gonna be so amazing. So I'm gonna watch this carefully. I'm gonna try not to let the temperature swing more than five degrees either way. I'm gonna start it off nice and slow at 250, but after about the first hour, I'm gonna jump it up to 275, my normal cooking temperature, but I'm gonna play it by ear. I know I can always up the temperature but what I don't want to do is start too hot, have problems that I can't recover from. So start at 250, but the main cook temperature will be 275 unless I tell you otherwise. Okay, so the brisket has been on here for a little over, well, actually almost three hours now. So let's take a look at what it looks like and then let's talk about Wagyu. Now the exterior meat surfaces are starting to look really red, which tells me that the myoglobin has kind of been locked in place and we're getting good smoke flavor on the exterior of the meat. We're in the middle of the cook now and uh, this part doesn't get a lot of glory or a lot of talk, but you know, as a pit master, what that really means is you're managing a fire. So this is what I do for the vast majority of my time. So a lot of times when people ask me what I do for a living, uh, I will jokingly say I watch fires, which is what I do for the majority of my time. But let's talk about what Wagyu is and why it's special. Earlier we said we had Japanese A5 Wagyu and it's special for basically two reasons. Number one is the Japanese A5 Wagyu is kind of the top of the totem pole when it comes to fat marbling in the meat. So we have USDA Select, which is not very great. Then we have Choice, which is very common. Then we have Prime, which is good. But when you compare that to the Japanese scale, Prime is nowhere close to the top. It's not even in the same universe. I'll see if I can insert a graphic here of a comparison between the two, but Japanese, the top grade is A5. And that's exactly the kind of brisket that we have, which means it has absolutely tremendous marbling, something that you're not gonna find in any other cattle, in any other part of the world. This is literally the highest quality beef money can buy. The thing that makes the marbling in the Japanese A5 special is that there's simply more of it than in any other kind of beef in the world. So with a select brisket, it'll just be lean meat in the flat. With a choice brisket, which you might find you know, in a lot of places, you might see one or two specks of fat in the muscle. With a prime brisket, you might see a few specks of fat. This is better marbling than you'll find in the highest quality ribeye steak in your area, probably. Quite frankly, the marbling here is tremendous. It's gonna be the best marbling we've ever seen. Look, the marbling in Japanese A5 Wagyu beef, it's a psychological operation. What's happening is the Japanese government's trying to control American minds. You explain to me what happened with this Wagyu beef. 
back when I was a Navy SEAL before I became the governor of Minnesota and wrestled Ricky Steamboat at WrestleMania, I knew that there was a conspiracy about this Wagyu meat. All joking aside, the simple fact is there is more fat intramuscularly, or that is marbling within the meat, in Japanese A5 Wagyu beef than in any other kind of beef in the entire world. But that's only one part of why it's so special. So here we see the trimmings from the brisket before. One thing you notice is just from being out in the sun, even though it's not hot outside, it's just the sun in the morning has turned a lot of this to liquid on the outside. So if you look at these gloves, they're covered in liquid. That's not water, that is rendered fat. The second part that makes Wagyu beef so special is that it renders at a very low temperature, which means you don't have to cook it to oblivion for that fat to render and offer moisture in the meat that you're eating. And I've preached this many times. What you perceive as moisture in meat isn't usually water. It's usually rendered fat. How many of you have had a chuck roast cooked in a crock pot? It's literally soaking in water, but you eat it and it tastes dry and stringy. The reason why is because what you perceive as moisture is rendered fat. And this fat renders at a lower temperature than basically any other beef fat. And the reason behind that is this. You could take a jug of olive oil. That's pure fat. You could take, you know, chunks of beef that you trim off a select brisket. Also pure fat. And one is a solid, one is a liquid. And there's a little bit of kind of biochemistry behind that. The reason why olive oil is a liquid, whereas, you know, beef fat is a solid or kind of, you know, room temperature coconut oil is a solid is because it has to do with how much saturated fat is present in that fat product. Olive oil has a lot of unsaturated fat, which for our intents and purposes means it's less dense. It doesn't pack together as well. So if you want to think about what fat is chemically, essentially there's a molecule called glycerol, and you can think of it as a molecule having three hooks. And on those three hooks, you hang three fatty acids, basically long carbon chains that make up fat. If you have unsaturated fatty acids, those chains aren't straight. They kind of bend off and are crooked and don't let things pack easily. But if they're saturated, they're straight and they pack easily. And a lot of times they're solids at room temperature. So when you have something like olive oil, lots of unsaturated fat. When you have really hard fat from beef, almost exclusively saturated fat. Then you have something in the middle, say like coconut oil, which will melt at a low temperature, or butter, which is kind of solid at room temperature, but very soft. The reason Wagyu fat is special is because it has far more unsaturated fatty acids than regular beef. What does that mean? That means it melts at a lower temperature, it renders and provides moisture, or what you perceive as moisture, while you eat the beef. That's why Japanese beef is highly sought after and extremely expensive. The reason people are willing to pay big bucks for this beef is precisely because you can't recreate it any other way. And there are a couple reasons behind why it's so special. Number one is the breed of beef. We use the word Wagyu to talk about Wagyu beef, of course. Now, a lot of times people will confuse or conflate Wagyu with Kobe. Kobe is kind of a, you can think of it as a brand of beef. Right, so Wagyu beef is just the Japanese word for cow. So any of the Japanese breeds, I think there are four, are Wagyu. But what makes Kobe beef Kobe beef is that it's grown in a certain prefecture and it gets certified through a certain process. And it's just one particular version of Wagyu beef. It just happens to be the most well-known. So in the United States, I think there are only a couple places that actually sell legitimate real Kobe beef. So if you see Kobe on something you buy at you know, any store or you order online, it's probably fake, not always, but probably fake. That doesn't mean it's necessarily better, it's just the most well-known brand. But with Wagyu beef, you can get something that's just as good as any Kobe, it's just based on the rating. And in this case, the A5 rating is the highest rating there is, which means we have the highest degree of marbling in our meat, and we know that with those cattle, it's going to render extremely well. You're going to have amazingly moist meat that you wouldn't be able to recreate by any other means. And then lastly, the reason that Wagyu beef, apart from the breed having just incredible marbling properties, the reason it's so special is how they raise them in Japan. So they give them massages and they feed them beer and they don't want them to be stressed out. They treat them in a way that is all about pampering the animal so that you have ultimate marbling in the meat. And that's something that we just don't do here in the United States. We can grow them ethically, you know, on a pasture and maybe feed them some grain in the end of their lives. 
we don't have kind of the built-in animal husbandry to raise them in the way that they raise them in Japan. That's why this is absolutely remarkable. Now, I have a tendency to ramble, and I feel like I've maybe been doing that right now because I just gush over, you know, all the geek aspects of meat and science. I love meat, I love science, and, you know, to kind of delve into it is a lot of fun for me. So if any of that was confusing, let me break it down. Reason number one, it's special. Lots of marbling. Reason number two, that marbling melts at a lower temperature and provides moisture to the meat. And the reason those two things are present are because the Wagyu breed are exceptional for marbling and the way they raise them in Japan produces the kind of fat that renders extremely well. Now earlier I mentioned that you might find things labeled as Kobe beef or Kobe style beef and a lot of times it's kind of a, a counterfeit. Um, I don't want to you know, call into question the motives of the people who had named them those things. But probably, if I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, it's because people associate Kobe with Wagyu, and in a lot of people's minds, those things are synonymous. So what they want to do is they want to market their product in a way that is commensurate with how the consumer will view that product. So just keep in mind that most of what you see as Kobe is not Kobe beef. Now, all that is to say that if you encounter something called Kobe beef, it's probably not Kobe beef, but you might encounter something called Wagyu beef. Now, there's a lot of leeway. So, for instance, in the United States, we have Angus beef. And a lot of times, the only thing that's really required for something to be Angus beef is that the cattle have black hides. So, certified Angus beef, it has to be black hided cattle. And so, it's not necessarily that they're going in and doing DNA tests on these cattle that are certified Angus beef. I'm sure they have some proportion. Maybe it's 100%, maybe it's 92%, maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 36%, but we don't really know. With Wagyu, it's also very fuzzy. Most of the Wagyu beef that you will encounter is a Wagyu hybrid. So there are Australian companies that will market Wagyu beef. There are a couple places in the United States that do Wagyu beef, but almost always they're hybrids. Um, I only know of maybe one company that does pure blood Wagyu. And the reason American companies and Australian companies tend to hybridize the beef is because, number one, there is such a ridiculous amount of marbling in Wagyu beef that's full blood that you don't really miss it necessarily if you've got, you know, a 50-50 crossbreed with Wagyu and, say, Black Angus or Wagyu and insert breed of your choice. There's so much marbling that it doesn't really matter to the average consumer. The second reason is because there are characteristics of those breeds with which they cross the Wagyu that are desirable. So for instance, Angus grow quickly and they're you know, a hardy breed and they have a tremendous taste. So you cross Wagyu with Angus, that's great. Or a Holstein. Holstein actually, even though they're typically dairy cattle, um, I am kind of familiar with them because my grandfather owned a dairy farm and he had tons of Holsteins there. Um, they grow very tall, so I would assume that these hybrids are larger than other kinds of hybrids, and there is tremendous marbling in the Holstein breed itself. So by crossing them, you get some added benefits, and you don't really lose everything in terms of marbling. It's still better than anything you're going to find that's labeled prime at any grocery store or at most any meat supplier. And the last thing I feel like I need to mention about Wagyu beef is, at least in my experience, there are two things that are different when you cook it, aside from the increased marbling and the increased rendered fat. Number one is the color is different. For some reason, there's a reddish color. Uh, the first time I actually cooked Wagyu beef, I thought I had a smoke ring that, you know, was five inches thick, you know, all the way through the point of my brisket. I thought, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened. I need to do this again. But then I realized it was probably just some function of the Wagyu beef having some kind of different chemical composition. The second thing that's different about the Wagyu beef is it has a different flavor. So what I associate in my head with a beefy flavor isn't something that I would necessarily compare exactly to Wagyu. If I ate Wagyu beef, I would know I'm eating beef. But the flavor is appreciably different. And as strange as this sounds, it tastes less beefy. And that could just be because the, the palate gets coated in rendered fat and the, the composition of the beef is a, you know, a little bit different. It still tastes phenomenal. It's still amazing. And I would take a Wagyu steak any day of the week. But just know that the flavor is going to be different and the color, once cooked, will also be different.
So we've been spraying this brisket about every 30 or 45 minutes, pretty much every time I add wood to the fire, I'm spraying that brisket. Um, I want every corner to be still moist and pliable, so that's what I've been doing, half vinegar, half water. Right now we have a great bark on here. If you push on the fat, it gives, it's rendered beautifully. Everything is great. So I have the two sheets of butcher paper out. I'm gonna spray it one more time with the vinegar water mixture, and then I'm gonna wrap it up, put it back on the smoker to finish. All right, back on the smoker after eight hours. So hopefully we're gonna look at maybe another two or three hours. By that point, it will be dark when it's done. So you may or may not see me pull it off, but we will take it inside, we will slice it up, and we will do a taste test and give you hopefully some good shots of the brisket when it's sliced. And you can see the difference that Japanese A5 Wagyu gives versus something you might find at your local grocery store. Okay, so this Japanese A5 Wagyu brisket even though it's really special, the ultimate test is eating it. And so if you take a look at this now, we see that the fat on top has all yellowed and started to render down, so exactly what we want to see. And we have on all the meat parts, we see a nice dark bark. And then if you peel that back a little bit, you see red from the smoke ring that would be underneath. And so the real test of this brisket isn't how pretty it is when we're cutting it up or trimming it, but it's how it tastes. And so it's time to do that now. All right, now to taste this brisket, I'm here at my friend Jonathan's house. And I've decided to trade him this brisket, Japanese A5 Wagyu, certified all the way from Japan for a roll of toilet paper. And so it only is fitting that we give it a shot together. I get the toilet paper, he gets the brisket, and uh, given the price of this today, this is almost a fair trade. I, I think it's pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty close. It's pretty close. I mean, there are people in fist fights at the grocery store right now to get toilet paper. I haven't seen anybody fighting over brisket yet. So, I don't know, maybe I'm getting out, you know, the better of this deal. Regardless, I will still get to try this and see how it is. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut some slices from the flat and then some slices from the point. And one thing that Jonathan pointed out was, actually, do you wanna explain kind of why you think it looks so strange? Well, Jerry brought this in and I, it was a really funny looking brisket and I couldn't figure out why it was so long and so skinny and it looks like they actually took the, the point and the flat, it almost filleted underneath between the two of them and then flipped the, the point back over. So it's almost like a butterfly brisket, which yeah. I've never seen before, but it's kind of an interesting way of doing it because it means you also get bark underneath the point on that part of the flat that normally is kind of the, I guess, at least in my opinion, the least tasty part of the, of the brisket. Right, it's not really exposed to the smoke underneath no. and it's not really exposed to smoke on top. And so what you have is this close textured, um, a lot of times not super moist part of the brisket that um, is kind of occupying space. And then you have the point on top that's delicious and you're like, oh, this is kind of a space holder underneath. Yep. And then a, a big chunk of fat that you don't want to eat in between. Right, right. I think we should try a regular brisket like that next. I'm up for it. Yeah, <laughs> I've cooked a ton of brisket, so yeah. I've benefited from most of those. I guess, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's try this one out. Um, maybe cut something kind of from the middle here. Now the first thing I noticed when cutting into this flat is we left enough of a fat cap on there that we, you know, we have some protection on the top of the meat, but we see that some smoke did penetrate through because we see a smoke ring, even though it's small, on the top. The second thing, and the most important thing, is that when you squeeze this together, you see fat glistening and juices flowing out of it. That's something that's incredibly rare in a flat. If you have accomplished that, then you should win a Nobel Prize in barbecue because you are a master and that never happens. This is kind of remarkable stuff. So at this point, let's taste it and find out how it is. So the two parts we're gonna taste first 
are I'm gonna take kind of the end cut from the flat and then a slice from the flat, see how those turned out. Um, if, you know, the barbecue flavor, if the smoke doesn't taste great, that's my fault, but I wanna see what's special about this brisket versus any other brisket you might find in the store. All right, there you go. All right. I feel like we should pray first or something. This is... <laughs> okay, here we go. Texture's really good. It's pretty good for a brisket flat. It is. It's when you squeeze it, you see all this rendered fat. I never see that. Just not on the flat. Yeah. It almost, it doesn't taste like the, um, <clears throat> like the point, <clears throat> but the reality is that the amount of moisture in it feels more like the point. Yeah, that's just, you know, that's just crazy to me. Um, no, that was good. Really strange. All right, I want to try this end cut, see what that tastes like. Ooh, you squeeze that. Even that's full of juice. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is gonna be good. That was good. The bark's really good. The smoke is more mellow than some of the other briskets I've had. From yeah. Not bad by any means, but there's not as much smoke to it as there's. How long not, did this not as clear versus, a signal. How long did this one smoke versus one of your normal briskets? Yeah, before wrapping, this was um, about six hours. Okay. Yeah. So usually I go eight or nine. Yeah. I just I just didn't want to destroy right. it. I wanted to be kind of conservative. But at this point, we're gonna try um, the most succulent portion of any brisket. And on this one, it should be particularly good. So what I'm gonna do is take a part of this point here and cut it up and see what that tastes like. Now, I wish you guys could be here because this cutting board is so saturated with juice like rendered fat, that it's dripping off of the cutting board onto the table and it's gonna be a big mess to clean up. But what that tells me is that these bites are gonna be incredibly moist. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try kind of burnt ends from the point of the brisket. And so that's usually the most moist part on any regular brisket. So this should be a life-changing experience. Wow. <laughs> it's rich. It's very rich. It's very rich. Couldn't eat a lot of those. No, I'm gonna say you can't eat a lot of that. I can eat another one though. <laughs> that was good. Wow, all the fat in it just, it kind of squishes and turns into nothingness while you're chewing it. But the texture's still good. I mean, it's still, it doesn't feel like mush. Right. But it feels very, very, very tender. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. Um, I really enjoyed this a lot. This is kind of a cool, new, different experience for me. Um, obviously, I've never cooked one before because this is the first time I've ever been able to find one. But if I had to do it again, if anybody out there is lucky enough to get you know your hands, your grubby mitts on one of these briskets, what I'd suggest is smoke it longer before wrapping. I would go lower temperature and try to build as much bark as possible because you're not gonna eliminate the moisture inside, but you're gonna crank up the flavor that you get on the exterior of the meat. So with each bite, you'll have huge flavor on the outside combined with the moisture of an incredibly marbled piece of meat on the inside. And that way, you'll have the best brisket you can possibly have. This is certainly no slouch, but if I did it again, I think that's how I would change it. Regardless, this is simply the most expensive brisket that I could possibly find and something that I probably won't have many times in my life, but I'm glad I had it now. And then, actually, for my own sake, this is part of the brisket that I usually trim off when I'm doing my own, my own stuff. You wanna try that? I think, I have a feeling this is gonna be good. Better mm. smoke. Get more flavor. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna need more salt. If anything, I noticed the that last bite had better smoke. Mm -hmm. But that would have been my my comment. Rose, I didn't get as much smoke out of this. That was actually that was the best bite, honestly. Yeah. That I had. Yeah. Yeah. So here, when when it has meat exposed top and bottom. Mm -hmm. See, I yeah. wonder if that's what it is, though. I mean, it, yeah. That was way better. All right. I'm trying that guy. Yeah, that was. 
Okay, so you guys can fight for the stuff right here in the middle. <laughs> okay? All right, one more thing we wanted to try. Here we had a part of the brisket right in the middle that's exposed meat on the top and the bottom. And so hopefully you get like a bigger dose of smoke flavor. And still, there's no part of this brisket that you can dry out. I mean, you could squeeze it. I feel like I could get 16 ounces of rendered fat if I squeeze this thing hard enough. So let's give it a shot. That's better. It's best bite so far. Superior. It's best bite so far. Yeah, more smoke, yeah. more flavor, better. I don't think it's possible to dry this thing out. I don't. I don't think you could. If I you did it, to try. that'd be a. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to try. <laughs> right, but yeah. Mm. Might need to keep cutting that right there. That's that's pretty good. Hmm? Might need to keep cutting that. That's pretty good. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I feel like if I. Keep cutting it too long, I won't get to leave with that toilet paper, so. I, I got another roll if you need it. So oh, okay. okay. All right. <laughs> and this beautiful apron I got. Does everybody know uh, that you have these aprons? They do know. They, they do know. All right. I feel official. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't look as good as you, but, you know. It's <laughs> that line from Men in Black, we make this look good. Yeah. You make it look good, I just go along for the ride. Anyhow, yeah. but it works. Oh, well, thank you for coming along for the ride. It's fun. <laughs> All right, now after trying several different parts of this brisket, uh, what are your final thoughts on what's different about this versus a brisket you would buy, you know, at a Costco or someplace like that? The the fat content was clearly different. Um, it was even all the way throughout. There was no there were no fatty areas necessarily that you right. had to necessarily cut away. So the moisture was was the best of any brisket I've ever had, and I've had a lot of briskets. Um, the smoke didn't have as much as some of the other ones, but the corner that we got right here actually probably had the best flavor of anything on there. Right. Um, it's really hard to find anything wrong with it. Right. And and even that corner that got beat up with, you know, smoke and heat was still moist. Very moist. Yeah. All the way through. All so way I through. think I was too cautious with this and kind of babied it along too much. Mm -hmm. I think if I would have gone harder, more smoke, um, try to render the fat more, try to build a bigger and thicker bark, that would have been a better choice. For me, this was a hopefully not once in a lifetime experience, maybe a few times in a lifetime, but yeah. As far as the fat, the fat is different in its composition, it's different in how it cooks, it's different in how it's layered through the meat, and even the, the flavor of the meat is a little bit different. So this is something that if you have the time and the money to try it once, absolutely 100% do it. Um, just make sure you build an incredible bark because you will not dry it out unless you light it on fire. And even then, it might still be moist on the inside. So. It's been a lot of fun to cook this for me. I think that just the insane amount of rendered fat in this is something that I'll think about 20 years from now. If you have an opportunity to do it, I would encourage you to. Really quick, one thing that I noticed while you know we're kind of hanging out and just kind of munching on this brisket is that for some reason, this fat, so the kind of the chemical composition of the fat may be playing into this, I'm not sure, but I actually am picking up a lot of smoke flavor in the fat itself. Typically, when I cook briskets, the fat doesn't really absorb smoke flavor. It's the meat that is exposed to the smoke on the exterior. For some reason, this absorbs that flavor and it's actually super good when you combine a piece of lean meat, even though it's packed with marbled fat, um, with some of the fat on the exterior because then you get a higher hit of smoke flavor. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button down below subscribe to the channel, and make sure to hit the notification bell. Because if you hit the notification bell, you get notified every time I produce new content. So when new videos come out, you'll know that they're out and you have an opportunity to find them and click on them and see hopefully fun and informative barbecue content. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, at Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'll see you guys next time. I enjoyed it. But it's probably because if I'm giving them the benefit, but probably if I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, Benefit of the doubt. All right, so we've been... Okay, try again. So what's this dog breed called? They're English setters. English so, Yeah, hunting dogs, they're, they're pointers. Ah. So they run, 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 smell the bird and point. So they do that? Yep. Okay, go. Yep, just like the bugs bunny again. Give me a program for that.